Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number 11 and I'm going to discuss magnetization or magnetic polarization. Specifically I'm going to discuss paramagnetism and diamagnetism. There are 10 videos previous to this in this section and I've written their titles on the bottom left and top right of your screen. The two most important of which are videos 9 and 10 where I discussed magnetic torque and the Bohr magneton. So we've discussed electric polarization in my series on electrostatics, which I think is the prerequisite for magnetostatics. And for that reason, I'm going to do a small bit of revision on electric polarization. And you can see my videos on electrostatics if you don't understand that. So let's revise what happens to a piece of matter when we have an externally applied electric field. Essentially, we can break down matter into either conducting material, which we call conductors, or non-conducting material, which we call dielectrics. So when we apply an external electric field on a conductor, the net result is that nothing happens to the conductor because on a very short time scale, electrons are driven inside the conductor and they create their own electric field, which cancels the applied field. So essentially, you get no electric fields in conductors. Then we think about dielectrics, and there can be two types of dielectric, polar and non-polar. So a polar molecule or a polar dielectric is one whose molecules have a permanent inbuilt electric dipole moment. So let's discuss what happens with non-polar dielectrics. Without an applied field, the center of the, electric cl the electron cloud and the center of the nucleus coincide. However, if you apply an external electric field, it causes the center of these to uh, separate and this essentially manifests as a tiny electric dipole and of course because of its electric dipole we have an electric dipole moment and electric potential and, a, and an electric field and the resulting electric field points in the exact same direction of the applied field and because all of the electron clouds and all of the nuclei essentially constitute an electric dipole moment you have lots of these pointing in the same direction and they sum and we get a, a large induced electric field and we call that electric polarization. So we said the, the, we say the material is, is now polarized. In polar molecules what happens is that the permanent inbuilt dipoles experience a torque. Now when we talk, talk about a permanent inbuilt dipole, if you think about water for example, H2O, the two hydrogen uh, atoms or the two hydrogen molecules are offset at a certain angle from oxygen and this creates a permanent inbuilt dipole moment which can undergo a torque in the externally applied field and the, the permanent field is aligned to the uh, the so excuse me the uh, induced field gets aligned to the applied field and we say that the medium is polarized so that's what happens now, in order for us to calculate the electric field due to this polarization, and the polarization comes from the external field, we instead calculate two different quantities. One is what we call the a bound surface charge, and one is called a bound volume charge. And by calculating the bound surface and volume charges and adding them, adding them together, we are able to calculate the total polarized field. So the trick is, in order for us to calculate the magnitude of the electric field due to the polarization, we calculate the magnitude of the electric field due to the bound surface charge and the bound volume charge, and this is equal to the polarization field. So now it's time for us to move on and discuss magnetic polarization or magnetization. First of all, I would like to define magnetization. This is when the magnetic moments due to orbiting or spinning atomic electrons become preferentially orientated to an applied magnetic field which increases the total magnetic field. So let's think about the electron magnetic moments and we essentially can have two types of magnetic moments. Because we know of course that a current loop constitutes a magnetic dipole which has a magnetic moment. And we can think of a very fast uh, excuse me, an, an orbiting or a spinning electron which is moving very quickly as approximating a current which therefore has a magnetic moment and uh, a, a magnetic moment and a field. 
So an orbiting electron, if we think about an electron orbiting a nucleus, we can say that this constitutes a current and it has an associated magnetic field. And we discussed this in the previous video when we discussed the Bohr magneton. So mu is the, the dipole moment and that's the charge E times the speed of, um, a speed of orbit V times the radius R divided by two. Or we can rewrite this in terms of the angular momentum L. It's important to remember that E in actual fact is, uh, is going to be minus for an electron, so we have minus Q. Now, a spinning electron, we can think about, let's say if you want to think about the classical situation where the Earth orbiting around the, the Sun can give us this particular magnetic moment. But the, we'll say the Earth itself spins on its own axis, and it, the electron we can we can say also spins on its own axis, and as a result has its own magnetic moment. But we find that the the magnetic moment due to spinning electron is almost identical to the magnetic moment of an orbiting electron. So let's continue. Let's first of all define paramagnetism and diamagnetism. Let's first of all discuss paramagnetism. So usually for atoms, the sum of the magnetic moments is zero, and they're, they're orientated in random directions. But if we think of elements which have an unpaired electron, so the unpaired electron, of course, will have its own magnetic moment, and it will have its own magnetic field. So if we apply an external magnetic field to this material with the unpaired electrons, the magnetic moments will experience a torque in this applied field, and thus, the magnetic moment and its associated field will align with the applied magnetic field. And since essentially every electron or every atom with an unpaired electron constitutes a small dipole moment and has a small field, they all point in the same direction and we get superposition and we get essentially magnetization or magne uh, magnetization happening. Next, let's discuss diamagnetism. Diamagnetism is when the orbital speed of an electron changes when we apply an external magnetic field. And because the speed changes, the magnetic moment and the associated field will change. And you can see that pretty quick, pretty easily by looking at this particular formula on the left formula on the left hand side of your screen. So because the magnetic moment and the field change, uh, the the total magnetic field is going to change. But the important point is that the direction is different because for an electron E is going to be equal to a, a minus number, it's going to be a minus Q, and that means that the, the new magnetic field, the change magnetic field, will be opposite in direction to the applied field. So for paramagnetism, the applied, or excuse me, the uh, magnetic moments in the field line up with the external field, but with diamagnetism, they don't line up, they actually uh, align anti-parallel and try and cancel the applied field. So now let's discuss paramagnetism. Just to remember again, this is the torque on the electron and it's due to the spinning of the electron. Now we said a moment ago that we have two magnetic moments due to an electron. One is when it orbits the nucleus and one when it spins on its own axis. But we'll see in a moment that it is very difficult for the orbit of the electron around the nucleus to experience a torque. It's quite difficult to move that. And as a result, it's, it, we don't see any effects. But the spinning electron on its own axis is quite easy to turn due to a torque. And as a result, it will experience uh, a, a significant torque and a, a, is, have a result, uh, a large magnetic field. So we saw in a previous video that any current loop can be approximated as the sum of many rectangular loops. So let's think of, a, for example, of a single electron. So let's take a single one of these loops here. And that's what we're going to analyze in the bottom left of your screen. So we've seen in the past that if we talk about a rectangular current loop or whatever, we can see that it has torque in it, that some components of the current loop will have no torque and other components will have torque. And this will, will make the the uh, the loop turn and it will have associated the, the sorry the magnetic moment will turn as well. So in video number f video number nine, what we saw was that the torque due to an applied magnetic field is going to be the cross product of the magnetic dipole moment and the applied magnetic field. Where we know that the magnetic dipole moment is the product of the current and the vector area. So what happens is that the torque due to the applied magnetic field 
aligns the current loop, which is essentially our spinning electron, and it aligns the current loop dipole with the magnetic field. And it only occurs with atoms having an odd number of electrons, because obviously if they have an even number of electrons, then all their magnetic moments and fields will just cancel. And it's important to note, by the way, that the field applied must be non-uniform, because if it's if it is uniform, well then what's going to happen here is that when we take the the uh, the closed line integral, well the, the closed line integral of a vector is going to be zero, and we're simply going to get a, a zero net force. So current loops, which essentially are magnetic dipoles, will experience a torque in an externally applied magnetic field. But atomic electrons have two current loops, which can experience a torque. The first one is due to the orbit around the nucleus itself, and the, one, the second one is due to the, the spin of the electron. And the orbit around the nucleus itself experiences a small torque because it is difficult to turn. However, the spin experiences a large torque. So it will, the spins will align in, uh, in the direction of the applied field, and they will all superpose, and you will get a large, you will get a large induced magnetic field, which we call magnetic polarization, or we call magnetization. So now it's time for us to move on and discuss diamagnetism. Essentially, diamagnetism is due to the change in an orbital electron speed when we apply an external field. So let's think about this as we let's say we have a, a magnetic field applied here. It's going to be perpendicular to the current loop, and we have a, our electron orbiting the center of our nucleus, and it's going to be orbiting at a certain speed and at a certain radius. So really what we're looking here is at the, is the Bohr magneton. So the length is going to be twice pi r, which is the circumference, and we know that the vector dipole moment is going to be the current times the vector area. We can imagine that the current magnitude of the current is simply going to be the charge divided by the time experience the time it takes to do one revolution. One revolution is twice pi r divided by the speed, so distance over time. And that's given on the top right of your screen. Putting the two of these together, we're able to get an expression for the, the current associated with an orbiting electron. So it's going to be Q, the charge in the electron, times its orbital speed, divided by the circumference, which is going to be twice pi r. If we try and then calculate the magnetic moment, we get I times A. A, by the way, is perpendicular to the current loop, so we have its direction. It's going to be I times pi r squared, which is QV over twice pi r times pi r squared, which is going to be Q times V times r over 2, and in the perpendicular direction. That's the Bohr magneton. But like I said earlier on, it's important to note that for electrons, the charge is in actual fact minus E. If it was a positron, it would be plus E. So that means that the, the, if we apply a magnetic field on an orbiting electron, the magnetic moment due to its speed is in actual fact in the opposite direction to the applied field, which means that the induced magnetic field is in the opposite direction to the applied field. Now, Let's think of what happens in the absence of a magnetic field. So if we have an electron rotating, the rotation is supported by the electrostatic or coulombic force, and that's pretty straightforward. So we, we use Newton's laws and we get F here is equal to the electrostatic force one over four pi epsilon zero, E squared over R squared. Now the centripetal force is MV squared over two, excuse MV squared over R. And I'm just going to call this this particular speed, I'm going to give it the subscript 2. And we'll see in a moment that I have another one, I'm going to give the subscript 1. Now just in case you're wondering, you, you can't remember where we get the centripetal force, let's imagine we have a center of, uh, a center of the orbit here, and we have the radius here, like this. So in a certain amount of time, the uh, an electron goes from this point to this point, so it goes, essentially its angle changes delta phi. So we can think of, we have two similar triangles. We have the, bear with me now, and I just, all right, we have, we'll say, the initial velocity, and then we have the, the final velocity, V1 and V2, like this, and they are separated by delta V, like this, so that is one triangle. And then, of course, we have the triangle, which separates here and here, which I'm going to call delta S, and we have the radius. So these are two similar triangles, and that gives us the following 
equations here. And we can rearrange that very straightforward and get the change in velocity is V1 over R times delta S. And we know that acceleration is delta V over delta T, which gives us V squared over R. And then F is equal to MA, so it's MV squared over R. And anyway, you could easily, you know, you could, I'm sure you know what that is. Anyway, so just to, to say again, if we don't have an externally applied magnetic field, the Coulombic force uh, is, supports the centripetal uh, force, and we get mv squared over r is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 e squared over r squared. Now, in the presence of a magnetic field, of course, we're going to have a component involving the magnetic field, and that's written on the top left of your screen. And I've just rearranged it so that we have the uh, Coulombic force. I'm going to call 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. I'm going to give that the placeholder k. So we can rewrite it like this. So this is in the presence of the magnetic field, and this is without the magnetic field. All right, so I'm going to equate the, the two of these. So this is pretty straightforward algebra, and it, I have done that on the bottom left of your screen. So we have the mass of the electron times it's the second velocity to d squared divided by r, and we have uh, minus the charge of the electron times V2 times B is equal to the mass of the electron times the uh, V1 squared over R as well. Now, notice the way I have uh, I have arranged this where we have essentially the difference of two squares here, uh, V2 to be squared minus V1 to be squared. And we know that's V2 minus V1 multiplied by V2 plus V1. But we know that V2 minus V1 is an actual fact delta V. That is the change in this speed of the electron. So I have taken this component here to the left-hand side of the, uh, the expression itself. So we have that the change in velocity is E, the charge on the electron, times R, which is the radius of orbit, times the magnetic field, divided by the mass. And then we have V2 over V2 plus V1. But if you think about it, the change in the speed isn't going to be very much. And I discuss this on the top right of your screen. Here you say V2 is approximately V1, therefore their sum is approximately twice V2. And what that means is that V2 over V2 plus V1 is approximately one half. And we get that the change in, in the speed is E times R times B over twice Me. So we see that the electron in actual fact speeds up because this is a positive number. So let's go back and have a look at the associated magnetic dipole moment with this change in speed. So just to remind us that the, the dipole moment, which I've written here, the dipole moment involves the speed of the electron. So the speed of the electron is going to speed up, but what happens to the direction of the, um, the dipole moment? And we know, of course, already, because I've said it, that it goes in the opposite direction because of the minus, minus q. So we get that the change in the magnetic moment here is minus e squared r squared times b over 4me. So the point here is that when you... Uh, change the speed of the electron due to an applied field, the associated dipole moment and induced field are in the opposite direction to the applied field. And that is diamagnetism. Because each electron orbiting an atom constitutes a small dipole moment and small current, and all of them will try and move in the opposite direction to the, or the, all their speeds will cause an, an induced field which is in opposite direction to the applied field. So we get them all superposing and we get uh, a, an applied field or diamagnetic applied, induced field, excuse me, against the applied field. So let's recap. Paramagnetism. This is when we have the torque on the spin of the electron dipoles and it causes the magnetic moment and the magnetic field due to the spinning uh, electric dipoles to align parallel to the applied field and they superpose but the torque on the orbital motion is negligible because it's difficult to have a turning force in the torque it's found mainly in atoms with an unpaired electron because otherwise we just would have the sum of the moments equal to zero and the field is parallel to the applied field this is in contrast to diamagnetism where the orbital electron speed changes, causing an induced magnetic field, which is anti-parallel to the applied field. Now, it's important to note that this occurs in all atoms. But the magnitude of this is much weaker than that of paramagnetism, 
and for that reason it's usually only seen in atoms with an even number of electrons. Because although it occurs in atoms with an odd number of electrons, those atoms also experience paramagnetism, which is larger in magnitude and in, op in the opposite direction. The last thing I'd like to say is that for the electric polarization, we had small p was the electric dipole moment, and we called electric polarization equal to the electric dipole moment per unit volume. Similarly, we can say that magnetization is the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. So once again, for non-uniform magnetic fields, a paramagnet is attracted to the field, whereas a diamagnet is repelled. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.